All right, as we get started today, go ahead and have your homework handouts out. Have your homework handouts out. Hold them up if you would so that I can see that they are completed. Excellent and uh, good. All right. And uh, let's go ahead and before we get to the handout, though, let's review the rest of the chapter and then we'll hit the math right at the end. Uh, we're talking about in chapter four, which state of matter class? Yes. Gases, and we said in our atmosphere the two most abundant gases are? Nitrogen and which of them is more abundant of the two? Nitrogen, nitrogen over three times as much nitrogen, and uh, <coughs> almost four times as much actually. And we said this is important for, uh, for what two reasons? Plants. Plants need it to uh, thrive, and we need plants to thrive, and? We don't explode. So we don't explode when we light a match, or strike a flint, or whatever they did back in the day. Um, we said that uh, air molecules are uh, buzzing around at incredibly high rates of speed. Anyone remember about how fast air molecules are buzzing around you right now? A thousand miles an hour, bombarding you. This bombardment of air molecules is called? Air pressure. Air pressure. We said two major factors affect air pressure. <coughs> oh, I was, sorry, I was pointing it out, or you were in mid-cough, so your eyes were closed. That's what he said. Michael? Uh, number of molecules, which in its way, because of gravity, there are more molecules down at sea level to bombard you, but uh, yeah, temperature and number of molecules, absence of air and other matters called a okay. vacuum. At sea level, what is the weight of the air or the atmospheric pressure at sea level? 14.7 pounds per square inch. And of course we said just like a liquid, the, uh, the force is applied to perpendicular normal to every surface. So I'm not lifting air, or I guess I am, but air is also helping to lift my hands. So um, nothing impressive there. But if we could get air not to be underneath my hands, that would be quite a feat just to be able to lift my hands, right? Um, the, uh, the, the girl we got vacuum packed, right? Got a chance to feel what it would the air would feel like, how strongly it would pressure, push on you, if you didn't have the air all around your body pushing back against it. Uh, her body, of course, is still pressurized. Um, who was that uh, German guy who uh, had the, the 16 horses and the, the copper hemispheres? It's a German name, at least. Gerich. Otto von Gerich. Otto von Gerich. Um, we said that uh, since gases flow, liquids flow collectively, it can be called fluids. And a couple of principles that we applied to gases as we had applied to liquids. Um, Archimedes principle. And Bernoulli's. Bernoulli's principle. What do Archimedes principle say? Um, the weight is displaced. Um, the What's the big idea with Archimedes' principle? Floating things, right? Floating things, okay? So something floats in a fluid if it is less dense than the fluid, right? Uh, so there's this lifting force, this buoyant force. Right? That's what we call it in a liquid, at least. We don't usually use that term in air, but it's kind of the same thing. Right? There's a buoyancy, a buoyant force, an upward force uh, that would lift something that is less dense. Now, the buoyant force is equal to the weight of displaced air in air, liquid in liquid, but uh, yeah, it's just density determines whether or not an object will float in a liquid, also whether it will rise in a gas. Uh, Bernoulli's principle, what was that all about, Michael? You've got to stop the yawning. You keep yawning right as I'm finishing every question. It's like trying to get out of it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's um, faster moving air creates lower pressure. Okay, good. Fast moving fluid or fast moving air has less lateral. lateral pressure specifically, right? The forward pressure is actually greater, right? Like, uh, you know, you uh, you blast the garden hose at your brother. Okay, there's, there's pressure forward there, right? Or, or you know, stand right in front of the, the hair dryer or the leaf blower, right? You feel a pressure of the air because it's being forced at you, but the lateral pressure is what decreases. And uh, so we did some fun things with that. Um, we said uh, one, uh, Bernoulli's principle is one explanation that's been posited for why an airplane gets a lift. What do we call that, uh, the shape of the cross-section of an airplane wing? Um, 
What's that shape called? Airfoil. An airfoil, good. And uh, the purpose of the airfoil, again, just a an object whose surfaces are designed to provide mm -hmm. lift, right? And we get that lift. Again, according to Bernoulli's principle, the thought was that as the air hits the front of the wing, Audrey, more of the air is pushed okay. over the wing. And as it's pushed over the wing, it has to move faster to get across because there's more of it, uh, was the thought. And as it moves faster, increase in velocity, decrease in lateral pressure. And since the air is going this way, lateral meaning top and bottom pressure, uh, underneath the uh, velocity, supposedly undisturbed, had greater pressure underneath. Um, again, people kind of poo-poo on that idea. So uh, there's some other ideas out there. Do you remember one of the other ideas? The, 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 the thicker front of the wing and thinner back of the wing, it's as though the front of the wing kind of pushes the air out of the way and then there's nothing over the back of the wing, or at least not in that immediate vicinity, which again creates a low pressure uh, area above the wing. Uh, the other idea? Action reaction, right? Especially if the wing is uh, angled as it at takeoff, right? That angle pushes, uh, forces air downward, which pushes the plane upward. Certainly that's what's in play with a, um, uh, you know, helicopter rotors, fan blades, things like that. Uh, so that's the other thought on um, uh, lift and that kind of thing. There's actually, uh, I believe it's NASA's website, has a whole article, Bernoulli or Newton? There's a debate. Is it Bernoulli's principle or Newton's third law? Which one is it? Um, Horror vacui, long time, uh, long believed to be true. Basically, it means nature abhors or hates a vacuum. Uh, but somebody come along and say, nope, not true. Who was the guy who said not true? Okay. Yeah, Galileo, star pupil, evangelist, the Porticelli. And the Porticelli uh, discovered that uh, the water wouldn't go all the way up in wells that were too deep. What was that? Kind of the magic depth that Torricelli thought he had discovered. 32 feet. Turns out really, if all things were as they should have been, water could have gone up to 33.9 feet. But 32 feet uh, was what he observed. And uh, of course, uh, he decided that was impractical. So instead of using water, he used mercury and found that atmospheric pressure not only could support you know however many feet of water, but could also support how much mercury. So 760 millimeters of mercury, and uh, of course we now call that Tor in his honor, and um, thereby he invented the first barometer, barometer right? And so uh, we do say that standard atmospheric pressure is, as Audrey said, 760 Tor. Uh, what's another me uh, measure of atmospheric pressure we could have? I was sure you're gonna make him do that one. All right, the other one. Ready for one atmosphere. One point zero atmospheres. Your three measures of standard atmospheric pressure. Uh, we said nowadays, you know, a lot of the barometers don't necessarily use mercury. They they just use a, a cylinder that can be squeezed as it squeezes the dial moves. What do we call those barometers now? Mm -hmm. Interway barometers. Um, talked about some gas laws. Uh, there was a guy who talked about volume and pressure. Who was the guy who talked about volume and pressure? Mm -hmm. Robert Boyle. And what do you say about volume and pressure? Inversely. They are inversely proportional. Uh, another guy talked about volume and temperature. Charles. John Charles. And he said? Um, volume and temperature. So long as temperature is in um, Kelvin. Kelvin. So we have an absolute temperature. We don't have to do with negatives. Also looked at Gator Sachs law. We kind of put them all together. You know what we call the combined <coughs> gas law. And what was that equation that we needed for our first three problems on the handout? Uh, Audrey? Um, 3Y, 3Y, over 2Y equals 3T, P2, over 2T. There we go. Uh, from there we talked about uh, a guy who came with a really important number, the mole. Uh, what is that number again, Audrey? Good, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, uh, October 23rd, by the way, the 10, 23, 10 to the 23rd. So October 23rd is uh, National Mole Day, and it's celebrated from 6.22 a.m. to 6.22 p.m. 
National Mole Day. So science nerds all over the country will, will gather and uh, celebrate the mole and wear their mole day hats and mail each other mole day postcards. And well, I don't know about all that. I do remember I had a cool science teacher when I was in school. See, I'm not cool, but she was cool. Shout out to Don McKenzie. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> she was a cool science teacher. And so she made mole molasses cookies shaped like little moles. She had a little mole shaped uh, cookie cutter. And we ate molasses cookies on National Mole Day. And she gave us all National Mole Day postcards. I don't still have the postcard, Mrs. McKenzie, if you're watching, I'm sorry. All right, uh, but anyway, I do remember it though. It made an impression on my life. Uh, but yeah, it starts the celebration at 622 in the morning when you first get up and uh, cease the celebration at 6.22 p.m. Anyway, um, two more Fridays. I have two weeks from today. National Mole Day. Anyway, who is the scientist who came up with the idea of the mole? Avogadro. Avogadro. And uh, Avogadro uh, came up with the idea with Avogadro's law, which said that if you have two different gases, but you have the same volume, same pressure on them, same temperature they're stored at, what will be true? Mm -hmm. Different masses. Well, probably they'll have different masses, but despite having different masses, this is the important part, mm -hmm. same number of molecules. So if the volume's the same, the pressure's the same, the temperature's same, also will be true is the mm -hmm. same number of molecules measured in moles. And so uh, we took then Avogadro's law and said, well, if that's true, that if we know the volume, pressure, and temperature, we should be able to know the number of molecules if it's the same anyway. And so we had this universal gas constant that related <laughs> the three things together. What was that universal gas constant, Michael? Mm -hmm. No, 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 the, the, the value of the gas constant. Oh, R. Yeah, it's represented by the letter R because, I mean, universal gas constant. R, right? Makes a lot of sense. Uh, what was the value for R? Oh, boy, you're right. Rule is dexic there. Descending order, 2, 1. Point zero eight two one, And then the units were kind of funky. Either of you remember? Um, there we go. So point zero eight two one liters times atmospheres over Kelvin times mole. And we can put all that together in what we call the ideal gas law. And that's the equation you would have needed for your last homework problem. And what is that ideal gas law equation, Audrey? Uh, PV equals that PV equals nRT, uh, where of course the P class is pressure, but it has to be in atmospheres because of the way the universal gas constant is constructed. All right, the V is volume, which would have to be in liters because of the way this is constructed, right? So yeah, you can measure volume in other units, but not for this equation if we're using this gas constant. And of course, simply is the number of moles, which we'll have to calculate based on molar mass and the given mass of the gas, R, of course, we already said universal gas constant. Of course, T class is temperature measured in Kelvin, just like it was here, right? Measured Kelvin. Here, though, the volumes, they just have to match, right? If one's cubic centimeters, the other's cubic centimeters. One's cubic meters, the other's cubic meters. One's liters, the other liters. For the pressure, one's toward, the other's toward. One's pascals, the other's pascals. One's atmosphere, the other atmosphere. It's just temperature has to be Kelvin for these gas laws. And uh, for this equation, we have very specific units that it would have to be used. From there, we looked at some different devices yesterday. Uh, we looked at some. Michael even felt a little bit of one. And, uh, and we discussed several others. Devices that either move air, transport air, or are driven by air pressure. Air pressure makes them work. What do they call these devices that transport air or are driven by air pressure? Pneumatic devices, good. And um, one of the pneumatic devices we looked at specifically was the sprayer, and that's where Michael got slightly sprayed from a distance. And the idea is that as air or fluid of any kind passes across the top of the straw, it uh, kind of seems to suck the liquid up with it, and it goes along with the, um, with the uh, moving fluid current. What do we call that term of liquid being caught up and carried away by a nearby fluid stream? Entrainment, good. We also looked at a device specifically that uh, transported liquid from a higher container down to a lower container such as the illegal stealing of gas, a siphon. 
And uh, which, by the way, not all siphons have to have the you know sucking with your mouth. Uh, my dad had, had not to steal gas. Okay, for the record. Okay, I uh, had a siphon pump. It's just a little squeeze thing that uh, you could squeeze and it forces air out one end, so it suctions the air out without putting your mouth on a container. And it was in case of a hurricane, because we lived in Florida, if he needed more gas for the generator, he could take it out of his own gas tank to put into his generator, okay? It was not to steal gas from other people. I'm sure of it. All right. <laughs> anyway, that kind of wraps up the terms from Chapter 4. Any questions on the terms before we look at the math? All right. Let's take a look at the math then. And uh, you've got your handouts ready. I'm going to read the first problem on the handout there, if you would, please. Michael. Yeah. Assuming gas has a volume of 4.51 liters under standard atmospheric pressure, if the gas is compressed by 1.83 tons in the fifth pascal, so the pressure, find the new volume of gas. All right. What is <coughs> not mentioned? <coughs> temperature. Temperature is not mentioned, that it must not factor in, meaning the temperature just stays consistent from part A to part B. So we'll just ignore the temperature here. And uh, we'll plug in the numbers, right? We'll take our, our volume, which uh, was uh, 4.51 liters. Our pressure, it says standard atmospheric pressure. What do I put for that, Michael? Uh, 1 ATM. Well, I would, except. Yeah, the other pressure is given in Pascal. So, even, well, we've got options on which one we could use because the other pressure is given in terms of pascals, which that's not a whole lot of increase in pressure, frankly. Um, then we've got to use the pascals here. What do we get for the volume of the gas? Well, still shrunk the gas a, a fair bit. 2.5. Uh, I'm sorry? 2.50. Yeah, but I got three safe here. So 2.50 liters is what I got for that. Audrey, looks like no. What did you have? 11.3. Did you use the B1, P1 over T1, B2? No, those numbers. So just somehow the way it plugged in didn't come out correctly. Did you put the 4.51 with the 1.83? Um, and then divide out the 1.013? I'm not sure. You're not sure? Let me look at work. I didn't write it exactly like that, so I may have mixed it up. Mm. Uh, yeah, your numbers are written correctly. You just didn't put them into the formula itself. So it's hard to tell. I wonder just based on the number that you had, part of me wonders if you just got those swaps. So you multiplied these two and divided this out instead of multiplying and then dividing that out. Mm -hmm. um, but it's hard to tell without seeing the work. All right, we're going to read the next one for us, if you would, Audrey. A balloon holds 96.2 cubic centimeters of gas at room temperature, 295 Kelvin. When if the balloon is placed into a freezer at 265 Kelvin, Find the resulting volume. Two if the balloon are instead placed into pot of warm water, 312 Kelvin, find the resulting volume. All right, notice it never references pressure. pressure. So we can assume pressure remains constant, standard atmospheric pressure, and so we can ignore the pressure and just get volume over temperature equals volume over temperature. So really the first problem was Boyle's law, the second problem is Charles's, this is his law. Um, we know the volume starting out is 96.2 cubic centimeters. We don't know the resulting volume, but we do know we start out at room temperature, 295 Kelvin, and in the freezer, it drops to 265 Kelvin. So, cross, multiply, solve. What do we get for the volume of the balloon in the freezer, Audrey? 86.4 cubic centimeters. So it shrinks about 10 cubic centimeters in the freezer. What if we put it in the pot of warm water, which was the 312 Kelvin? Michael? I got them both wrong. Got them both wrong. 102 cubic centimeters. Do you know what you did? Yeah, I put uh, T next to it instead of uh, I do it VT equals VT instead of V over T. So, yeah, I like to just start with the combined gas law and then just cross out or erase or whatever, whatever I don't need. So, careful there. All right, read the next one for us, Michael. <coughs> Oxygen gas at room temperature in 295 Kelvin is pressurized by 840 torque and stored in a 2.5 liter tank. Find the pressure needed to compress the oxygen to into a 1.35 liter tank if it is to be stored at a freezer at 257. All right, so uh, it mentions everything, right? Everything, everything gets uh, gets a shout out here. The volume, temperatures, pressures. So we need the works, right? We need the V1, P1 over T1 and the V2, P2 over T2. We need vice president and treasurer. Well, that's debatable, but anyway. All right, so uh, we've got a certain volume 
and um, 2.5 liters. And uh, it was already pressurized at 840 torr. And uh, that was at a temperature of 295 Kelvin. All right, then we need to shrink, pressurize it even more to get it down into a smaller tank that is good. And the liters and liters match. That's all that matters. All right, the pressure is, that's what we're finding, right? The pressure is P2. And then we're going to store it in a freezer at a temperature of, all right, did we get all of that? All right, and so then we're going to cross multiply, right? Take the three that you know, all right, multiply them and divide out the other two values here, and uh, how much pressure is going to be needed to get it down into that tank? Audrey? 1,360. Good, you go to three sig figs, 1,360 torr. Good, 1,355.1, blah, 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 and then round off. All right, questions on combined gas law. That's everything we were doing first. All right, now let's come to the last one. And again, in each of these, there was a volume and a new volume. There's a volume and a new volume. There's a temperature and a new temperature. There's a pressure and a pressure changes, right? All of those had something changing, right? Volume changes, temperature changes, pressure changes. Look at the last problem. Read it for us, Audrey. On the volume 68 grams of carbon dioxide gas under normal atmospheric pressure at a temperature of 96 Kelvin. It doesn't mention any before or after. This changes, that changes, right? You see the difference. Also, it mentions the mass. So that's an important thing as well. So uh, that tells us we're not using the combined gas law, but rather, Michael? Um, the other one. The other one, what do you call it? Yes. Um, ideal. ideal gas law. It uses the universal gas constant, but the ideal gas law, which is? Uh, the there we go. And uh, we're looking for find the volume, so we're going to rewrite the equation. Um, v equals All right. So. We're going to need to plug in the uh, the number of moles. Well, we already built R in class, so let's go ahead and get that in there. Good, Audrey. All right, and then the uh, temperature, we know that too. And the pressure. Oh, normal atmospheric pressure, that's what it is. Okay, so. Yeah, hey, that works out great, doesn't it? Because that means really, I mean, the atmosphere cancels for us, and the, like the Kelvin cancels here, but we don't really need to divide anything, do we? So really the key is how many moles do we have? Well, it says we have 68 grams of carbon dioxide. Well, is that a lot or is that a little? We don't know. So what we need to find is the molar mass of carbon dioxide. It says the atomic mass of carbon is 12.01 AMUs. I've only got one, so that is 12.01 AMUs. It says atomic mass of oxygen is 16, but I've got two of those, so class, 32. that's 32 AMUs. So what is the molecular mass of carbon dioxide? And therefore, what is the mass of one mole? Oh, yeah, yeah 44.01 grams. That's one mole. I've got more than a mole, don't I? I don't quite have two. I've got, a, what, around one and a half-ish, something like that. How do I get the exact number of moles? Just about 68 by the 44.01. How many moles do I got? One point five four blah, 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 right? Now, you're going to take the blah, blah, blah that's on your calculator. <laughs> Multiply by the other numbers, technically divide the one, but we're too lazy, we're not going to do that. And uh, what is the volume of our gas going to be? 39 rounded to the two sig figs, yes, 39 liters. Did we get that last night? No, I had the right process. I flipped and I did two carbon and one oxygen. Ah, I gotcha. Dicarbon oxide? <laughs> I don't know if that's what it's called, but... And that's what I'll go with. All right. Dicarbon monoxide. Dicarbon monoxide. That's, that's, that's what it would be, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not a chemistry guy, but I think that's right. All right. Questions on that? Questions at all on anything we've covered in Chapter 4? All right. Clear your desk. Except for a clean <coughs> paper and a pencil and a calculator.
a lens to paper, pencil, calculator, everything else away. First of all, let's name at the top of your paper along with today's date, which is 9-9-22. Nine nine twenty two. Coming up Sunday, be nine eleven. Also, Mr. McDonald's birthday. He wasn't actually born on that nine eleven, though. Imagine having some birthday cake to turn it on. I know, for real. Well, first it happened early enough in the morning, just ruined his birthday from the start. It didn't happen right as he was enjoying the birthday cake, but yeah, I'll ruin that birthday. Particularly if you actually knew someone, right, or had someone you loved who lived in the area that you were concerned for. All right. And this is quiz five. All right, pretty straightforward. Numbers one through ten, short answer. All right, the answers. And then uh, numbers uh, 11 through 13, problem solving. Solve them. Make sure you use proper sig figs, proper units in your answers. I would show work just in case you made a careless mistake or something. There's a bonus for you as well. All right, you may begin.